Well, hello there, everyone. I'm sure there are several of you out there in the viewing audience that are very excited to see that I've uploaded a couple of new videos after taking a bit of a pause. And I'm sure that there are some more of you in the viewing audience who are positively ecstatic to see some computer equipment, both in the foreground and the background on this video. You're probably making the assumption that I'm going to talk about computer equipment in this video, and you are absolutely right. Let me tell you about a little bit of a story for those of you who are just tuning in recently. Those of you who have been here for a while probably know some or all of this. Way, way back a while ago, a couple years ago at least, I believe, I found a Dell Dimension 2300 as well as a white plastic case Dell Dimension computer whose model number escapes me. Both of them set out for the trash collection, and I picked them up. They sat around in my garage for a while. The white plastic machine is still out there because I haven't ever really found anything interesting to do with it. But the black machine, the Dimension 2300, soon found a home in my live stream broadcasting studio. Now, if you don't know about my live streaming activities, check out the video description, as rather than get into it in here, I will post some details and a link to where you can find those particular shows. Well, the Dell Dimension 2300, despite the fact that it did not owe me a thing, has served extremely admirably in the role of a music player. It's a little light on processor power, especially especially in this Web 2.0 JavaScript-infested world that we live in today. But as far as playing music from my personal collection of digitized music files ripped from all my CDs and purchased from the iTunes Music Store, it has done extremely well. It has encountered a few failures over time, and those failures are what's leading to its being retired. Again, if you're new to this channel and new to my videos, you can read about all the failures that the machine encountered down in the video description. I'll be sure to talk about them in great detail down there. But the most recent failure that it suffered was during a live show while it was actually playing a song, one of the Audenboard Audio Systems channels started to drop rather dramatically in volume. And it's become increasingly common for the machine to have little foibles like that, so I really think that it's best to retire it. Well, what to replace it with? As you can see, that might be a complex question. <laughs> I was recently given a pair of uh, Dell Optiplex GX620 personal computer systems, both of these being retired after many years of heavy use, and they were to be recycled. Well, recycling doesn't discount reuse in my book, so the hard drives in these have both been wiped. This one is in perfect working condition. The other works, but has a couple of bloated caps and has been subjected over the years to some interesting repairs. Now, you saw there was a video card sitting on top of this machine. It did begin life with uh, dedicated graphics hardware installed. A little bit surprising for a business class machine such as an Optiplex. But I went ahead and took that out just because I really don't want to bother with the DMS-59 adapter. It's just one more thing to poke out of the back of the computer in what is already something of a tight space. And I don't need that much graphics horsepower. The onboard Intel GMA950 is way more than sufficient for my needs. Now some of you might be saying, oh, that's an Optiplex GX620. Wow, is that an old-fashioned piece of junk? And it's a Pentium 4. Great if you want a room heater, but not for much else. Well, yeah, I could probably go out and buy a cheap new computer or even something a little better on the used market. I might even have something better in my personal collection over there. But the simple fact of the matter is this machine will do an extremely proficient job of meeting my needs for a music player, and it's got more than enough processor horsepower to play the occasional video on YouTube if somebody requests a song or something that's not in my personal music library. So what I'm going to go ahead and do today is talk about some upgrades that I have in mind for the machine. We'll go ahead and take a look at these. Some of these things are from Newegg, and some of them are from not, are, are from not, are not from Newegg. So we'll see what we've got here. The first thing we've got is a hard drive. Which hard drive is this? I actually ordered two of them. I think this is the one terabyte drive. I was shocked to learn, because I can remember when these things cost the uh, thick end of $400 a piece, that you can buy a one terabyte hard drive. I think I gave $60 for this after any applicable discounts. I was absolutely stunned to discover just how cheap those have gotten. Four terabyte drives have taken their place, but I know those are just gonna get cheaper as well. We've got two optical drives in here. Both of these are ASUS branded drives. 
purchased for no particular reason other than they were pretty much the cheapest thing going. I was very surprised to learn that apparently parallel ATA optical drives are no longer made. You would think there'd be a tremendous market for them to this day. I mean, a lot of people are still rocking computers with some degree of parallel ATA hardware in them, or maybe a uh, lack of sufficient serial ATA connectors inside to hook up a new optical drive, but I guess the market's just not as great as I thought it was. <laughs> so these are both serial ATA drives, and the Optiplex GX620 will be more than fine with that because it has four serial ATA ports on the motherboard along with a single parallel ATA channel. So let's see what else is in here. We have a 250 gigabyte hard drive. This will replace the extremely aged but still quite functional 80 gigabyte drive in there. I figure, you know, I'm going to be sticking this thing in a cubby hole. I really don't want it to cause problems. So you might think that my choice of uh, drives here is a little bit odd. The reviews on these are very, very mixed, but I decided it was worth taking the chance. This is a recertified 250 gigabyte Western Digital hard drive. It's new enough that it appears to be a 6 gigabit per second serial ATA device, although obviously that does not matter in the case of this machine. So let's see what else we've got going on in here. Ah, yes. These, which I have not fully cut open yet, are floppy drives because, as you all know, or will very shortly, real computers have floppy drives. And I'm a little surprised that these machines did not come with them because they did have something inside that I found very curious. So go ahead and pop the cover off here and see if we can shed some light on what's going on. Although these machines were purchased new, direct from Dell, by their previous owner, and shipped with USB keyboards and mice from Dell, they have the interposer, the adapter I guess you could say, to provide them with both PS2 mouse and keyboard ports as well as a second serial port. Without that adapter, this is a kind of weenie modern computer, but it still does have a parallel port, and although you can't see it in that viewpoint, it has an onboard serial port as well. I might find use for the serial port because the pointing device that's built into my Model M keyboard on the current music player machine is actually connected via a serial interface. I may go ahead and switch to a slightly smaller keyboard though. We'll have to see. But I'm going to add a floppy drive to this machine. It will not be difficult to do because taped to the bottom of the case here is a floppy drive cable that is actually plugged in to the header connector on the motherboard. The only problem that I noticed with this machine, well with both of them actually, although the other one has at least one bloated capacitor on the motherboard, was dust. People who tell me in the past that these things collect dust like a vacuum cleaner are not kidding. They, they really do. It is amazing. And these things were just absolutely packed full of it. Well, let's go ahead and see what else is in here. This is an optical drive, another DVD burner. No particularly good reason for putting two of them in here, but I figured, you know, they're cheap. They're like, what, $17? <laughs> it's amazing the kind of money that, again, you know, these things used to cost and, and how cheap they've gotten to this, to this very day. I got a memory upgrade in here, uh, two Silverline 2 gigabyte modules. Yeah, two gigabytes in size on those. Oddly enough, this machine is based on the Intel 945 chipset, and while that chipset will recognize eight gigabytes of installed RAM, it only makes four of them accessible to the end user, which kind of hampers these machines. It's not really even remotely an interesting problem for someone like me who's just going to be doing something very simple with this, but if you're planning to upgrade one of these to a 64-bit operating system, it's definitely a limitation that's worth knowing about. These machines shipped from the factory with one gigabyte of memory. Someone gave this one a little bit of a nudge of an upgrade with one of the lowest profile memory dims I have ever seen. <laughs> This is a Kingston 512 megabyte, um, oh, how fast is this thing? I do not remember. It says 667 on it, so that's probably a pretty good bet. The modules I got 
are specified for 800 megahertz operation, but it's a moot point in this machine because it appears that the fastest that the Intel 945 chipset can operate any installed memory is at the 533 megahertz speed. Fortunately, I have an identical set of these silver line modules kicking around over here behind the cassette tapes, which I'm sure will generate some interesting comments. And I installed them in this machine just to make sure that they would work. So even though there's very little point to installing eight gigabytes of RAM in a machine like this, you can at least use the larger modules, which might be a plus if you can get them more cheaply. Now, some of you out there in the crowd are probably wondering just how it is I'm going to hook up my new serial ATA CD burners. Well, let me just tell you, I have an idea. Although there are extra serial ATA ports in this machine, the first two of them are up there at the top of the motherboard by the ATX power connector. The second set are down here behind the bundle of wires near the Dell logo on the motherboard. But you can see that Dell really expected and designed this machine for people to be using optical drives connected over the parallel ATA channel. And so the only thing that's accessible here are the conventional legacy 4-pin Molex style power connectors. Now you can get adapters for these really easily. There's no nothing that stops you from doing that. The adapters are both of cheap and very common. But Dell thought of this. You've probably noticed this little pigtail connector sticking out of the power supply here. And if I am right about this thing's function, my Dell Dimension 8300 that I actually bought new, probably one of the first mass market systems you could buy new with serial ATA anything installed, had, has this same connector, or one very close to it, on its power supply, and Dell actually connects a, an adapter harness to this to let you connect serial ATA devices. The main advantage to be had from doing this is that you get a 3.3 volt line, that's the orange wire right here, running to your serial ATA devices. Now that's not required. In fact, the adapters don't even provide it when they're plugged into these connectors because there is no 3.3 volt line on these. But I figured, you know, it can't hurt. And once again, eBay makes things both of common and cheap. Here is the adapter that would actually plug into that connector. Now because this is for an older machine and I don't know that Dell ever intended for this connector to be used in the Optiplex GX620, I am definitely going to make some multimeter checks so as not to let the smoke out of an optical drive. But you can see right away how that's keyed and the missing pin is in the same place. So it should simply plug on. Let me see if we can do that here on video. It might be a bit of a tight fit. Well, I think it's plugged in most of the way. <laughs> and there you have it. There's the connection. And at least going by the wire colors, it looks like everything is in the right place. We have the 3.3 volt line that's orange going out to the two 3.3 volt lines here. We have two black lines. Those are your common terminals going to two black wires on this end. We have two red wires for five volts. The only difference is in the white wire. It's a white wire on this end and it's a yellow wire on the other end. But I think we can pretty safely assume that's 12 volts because there's 12 volts supplied to these legacy 4-pin Molex connectors and they are sporting a white wire as well. So it's probably a pretty safe bet that Dell is playing at least a little bit fast and loose with the standard color coding. Now the nice thing about these Optiplex machines is that there's nothing to upgrading them. They're very, very easy. In fact, it's pretty much completely toolless. The first thing that you have to do is go ahead and pop the front cover off by simply pushing down this front uh, latch here. And you can also push this down. Go ahead and disconnect the optical drive. This machine had a CD only drive in it. It didn't work, so I installed a random uh, light on parallel ATA DVD burner CD reader into the machine to at least test it out and make sure that you know I could wipe the hard drive and stuff like that. It was actually quicker to do that than it was to try and find and prepare a USB stick. But as I was saying, these machines are almost completely toolless. So all you have to do is simply press down on the latch and pull your drive out. The same is true for the floppy drive. They all install in the same way. It's actually pretty slick. And one of the few places where you might need a tool, well, Dell has you covered. They supply screws for you to install additional drives. So you don't have to go hunting the slightly unusual type of screws that Dell used on these drives. So go ahead and take a look at the hard drives because they are also toolless. You can just pop this cage out of the bottom here. 
by pressing in on the two uh, side tabs there. They're springy. And it's a little bit of a gymnastic adventure. Put a hard drive in one of these. But it's not too bad, and if you can't manage it, well, a computer might not be the thing for you. <laughs> this one, this one's a little bit dusty. I didn't dust this machine out perfectly because right now the uh, pressure valve on my air compressor is not actually working. But I'm going to go ahead and install some of these upgrades, and I'll take a couple of in-between shots here showing you how I've gone ahead and put things together in preparation for the great upgrade. Now I have gone ahead and installed just a random copy of Windows 7 Ultimate 32-bit edition on this machine. It has a 3.4 gigahertz uh, Pentium 4 processor, not exactly sure of the code name, but it is 64-bit capable, although again with the aforementioned memory limitation there really doesn't seem to be any point in going any further than a 32-bit operating system can provide. So I'll be right back in a flash. Okay, I'm back, and after a pretty fair bit of cable wrangling inside this case, I've got everything that I added hooked up. I have the second, the temporary second hard drive there. I just want to make sure that this reconditioned drive works, and I might also run some software utilities to put it through its paces, because apparently the warranty period is not very long with those, and I've had mixed results. I had a Seagate one that was junk when it arrived. I've had a couple of Hitachi ones over the time, both of them, all of them factory reconditioned, that have just kept on working extremely well. I don't know about the Western Digital ones. I was willing to take a chance on it though, so I guess we shall see what happens. I unfurled the floppy cable. The tape on this actually disintegrated. It's a little bit sticky there, but <laughs> it kind of flung tape lint all over the case. I think I got most of it picked up. I have the floppy drive cabled in there. There's not really a good way to do this, unfortunately. Dell really put a lot of thought into cable management for these cases, but it's not perfect. And of course, I have not troubled myself to do the finest possible job of arranging things in here, because I'm really not that big of a stickler for this. In fact, I really, if you're going to do cable management, warning, obnoxious opinion alert, if you're going to do cable management, you should really do it right, get a case that supports it, because zip ties are not the right answer. We'll see just a little bit more of that in a moment. Got the serial ATA connections for power and data made to the new optical drives. I kind of tweaked this cable a little bit, but I think it'll work for testing. And those plug into the motherboard up here and down here. You can see on the motherboard a little bit of an artifact near the power connector. That four pin connector next to the analog device's 1980 sound chip is actually for compact disc audio. Way back in a previous age, when you played an audio CD in a CD-ROM drive, it actually decoded the digital audio itself and output it in either analog form or passed it directly using the SP-DIFF connector. Those things have completely vanished from optical drives today. There were very few drives made that actually had those connectors on the back, but stated on the cover or in the instructions that they were absolutely of no use. Now, back when... Uh, digital audio playback over the uh, IDE or SCSI bus first appeared. It really didn't work well, and I'm not hugely fond of it these days, but hey, at least it does work. And really, when I go to play CDs, I can just do it on a dedicated stereo. But enough of my ranting about obnoxious things. Got the monitor hooked up, a mouse plugged in, Ethernet cable's a little loose, power, PS2 keyboard, a Model M, if, if you have to ask, new memory modules, Let's go ahead and power this thing up and see what happens. I was also given these flat panel displays, both of which are in excellent working order. And this right here, folks, is just one of many reasons why I absolutely despise people using zip ties on computers. And I'm not interested about arguing, in an, arguing about it in the comments. So let's not even go there, folks. You have your opinions, I have mine. <laughs> you do it your way on your computers, but please don't try to enforce your viewpoints or inflict them upon me. With that said, we have our two new optical drives, floppy drive there, and go ahead and just put this little cover on. It actually looks like at one point in time, this machine might have enjoyed a tasty lunch, maybe a bit of coffee, something like that. It's really very hard to tell. But these did clean up pretty nicely. All right, there we go. 
The optical drives look great. It's always been my opinion though that these Dell machines, and this floppy drive was actually pulled from another Optiplex and purchased from a recycler, they don't, they don't look great with a floppy drive installed if you ask me. Alright, go ahead and move the side panel of the machine there. Get the keyboard up here. Happiness is a 10-foot keyboard cable. Except when you've only got about three feet worth of working space. <laughs> this is one of those keyboards rescued from the public school system many years ago. You can see it has definitely suffered a little bit over time. We're short a couple of keycaps, and we're missing the escape key. And I just haven't bothered to salvage any keys off of one of the Model M keyboards I've got with electronic defects to bring this one back to perfect fighting, perfect fighting trim. Let's go ahead and push the power button here. It didn't stay orange, so that's a good sign. Must have plugged everything back in. And we'll go into setup here and just take a quick look around at things. Hard drive noise is a little more noticeable than it was, but neither one of them is exactly shrieking, which is a good thing. So let's see what we've got here. 3.4 gigahertz Pentium 4. 4 gigabytes of memory running at 533 megahertz. Dual interleave channel mode, DDR2 of course. Uh, nothing in any of the expansion slots. There's the date and time. Boot sequence drives. This is what we really want. We need to make a few changes here. We have an internal diskette drive. Serial ATA drive number one is accounted for and turned on. We'll have to turn on... Uh, well, this thing counts them from zero, so drive number zero is on. <laughs> we'll turn drive number one on, drive number two, drive number three, which is really number four if you counted starting from one. And we'll definitely want to make sure to turn off the parallel ATA primary device so that this machine does not complain about it. The slave device is already off. You can leave that set where it is. I always turn smart reporting on. You know, some people say, well, smart's not of much use, but I have had it save the day for some clients in the past, so I figure it's free. <laughs> it can't hurt anything to turn it on. All right, hyper-threading is on, speed step. Yeah, this is a Pentium 4. And they're famous for consuming a lot of power, but speed step will help a little bit. Hard disk acoustic mode on performance. Nothing in security, nothing in power management, nothing in maintenance. I don't think we need to make any changes there, so we'll go ahead and exit the program here. And just see if the computer happens to start up. It's definitely going through all the right motions. I guess I could see if these have actually got power. Wow, those really open nice and quietly. I'm pretty impressed. <laughs> this is not the first time I've used ASUS drives in any sort of an enhancement or a build or anything like that. But it's definitely the first time in relatively recent history. The last ones I bought were parallel ATA drives. So let's go ahead and see what we've got here. Windows 8's coming up. I better figure out just where I put the mouse for this computer. I think that means you're doing something wrong if you start losing random pointing devices for computers. So where the heck did that thing go? Oh, it's clear over here. That's productive. Alright, I wanted to see that device driver installation. Yeah, it definitely looks like uh, all of our stuff is accounted for. Even the floppy disk drive was on the list. I'm pretty impressed. So if we go into the computer window here, I have to make it a little larger. You can see that there's a pretty fair bit of stuff in there right now. I think I will go ahead... Did I install speed fan on this machine? I'm really not sure. I think I did, but I'm not seeing it. <laughs> well, folks, this is live, uh, live recorded video, as ironic as that sounds. So that means that things, whatever can go wrong, probably will. So go ahead and load speed fan on this machine to check out the smart parameters on the newly added hard drive. Make sure it's not got any grossly obvious defects associated with it. And I'll be right back in a flash. If you're interested in the details on this system's microprocessor, I'll go ahead and zoom in on the CPU-Z identification window here. You can see it's a Pentium 4 650 microprocessor running the Prescott Core. I believe this machine will support some newer Pentium 4s, but I don't know exactly which ones. It's been a while since I've looked. 
But this is more than sufficient as far as microprocessors go for what I'm doing. This is way more speed than I would ever be likely to need. And I think that I actually ended up using the Pentium 4 650 in the Roach Palace Linux machine that I have also made a video about. If you're interested in seeing that, you can search for it from my channel page and find a complete video about it that goes into sometimes excruciating detail about the whole exciting subject behind the build for that computer. Now, these Dell BTX machines have an extremely formidable front panel fan in them. This is true of both the Optiplex and the Dimension Series machines like the two silver-faced ones over there. Now, Dell engages in some proprietary shenanigans to perform the fan control on these machines, and it's not completely understood how it's done, but the speed fan software has a mode of operation that will let you control the fan speed on Dell laptops. Fortunately, some of the desktops respond to this as well. However, SpeedFan's author is very clear when he says, do not enable this on anything other than a Dell notebook. So what you're seeing me do right now, don't try this at home. <laughs> Because if it makes smoke come out of your ears, or your ceiling fall down on your head, or your computer explode with six-foot flames shooting out of the monitor, well, guess what? I told you not to do it. <laughs> so, my responsibility ends at, so sorry, guess you're the proud owner of more than one piece instead of a, a single-piece computer now. But we can go ahead and turn up the fan speed here. I'll take the machine just a moment to respond. It really is the simple things that amuse me at times. takes a little bit for it to come up to speed. So I guess that while it's doing that, I can talk about another uh, closely related subject, and that is the subject of heat output. Someone did mention on uh, one of my YouTube videos talking about another Pentium 4 processor with SpeedStep. I can't remember who made the initial comment, but they said that the SpeedStep functionality of the Pentium 4 processors that had it was pretty lousy. And looking at what I'm seeing here, I do not disagree, because this microprocessor could throttle itself down a good deal more deeply than just settling at 2.8 gigahertz. But apparently Intel never decided to do that. And in fact, if I go ahead and kick up the microprocessor utilization to 100% here, you'll see it go ahead and kick itself up to pretty much full speed at 3,391.3. Megahertz, so just a little bit shy of the 3 gigahertz mark. You can also see that the multiplier jumped up a little bit there as well. For some reason, this fan is not speeding up. I don't know why. I have done this on these machines before. I know that it works. Unless, of course, this one has decided to be cantankerous about it. Nope, there it goes. I wouldn't stick your fingers in there if I were you. I don't know if that's actually full throttle for these or not, but I do know it's the most that speed fan can manage to ring out of them. And there's the rotational speed of the fan, in case you're wondering. It actually spins more normally at about 800, the high 800, low 900 RPM range, somewhere in there. Well, I've talked about pretty much everything I can think of to say. The newly added hard drive appears to have uh, excellent smart data, although it looks like Western Digital probably actually reset a lot of these values to their initial state. So the only way to know for sure will, to be, give, will be to give this drive a good workout, and that is exactly what I plan to do. You can use a couple of programs to do that. You can use HDAT, that's H-D-A-T, and the number 2 to run aggressive tests on the hard drive. It's freeware. Anybody can download it. Or you can use the Gibson Research Corporation Spinrite tool, which costs a little bit of money, but has, in my experience, been worth it several times in my uh, career during the times that I have used it. So we'll see how this drive ages over time as it's put into more use, but at least it works out of the box, which is more than I can say for some people that got one. And I'll go ahead, and when I'm satisfied that it is, in fact, working properly, I'll go ahead and pop the 80 gigabyte drive out of the primary slot, move the 250 into its place, and then put the one terabyte one down here. 
I will probably also try to find some more appropriately matched serial ATA cables for this machine so that things will be a little bit neater inside. And there I just wound the fan speed back down. So there's really not much more I can think of to test, but it might not hurt just to see if the sound and uh, audio playback capabilities on this machine actually work. Because in its previous life, I'm pretty sure that they were probably practically never used. There certainly weren't any speakers hooked up to these machines, and they don't have the little Dell business audio speaker that clips in here in the front panel. So I'm going to go ahead and hook it up to the stereo receiver over here if I can find a cable suitable for doing that. And I think I'll slap a CD in there and just see if it happens to play it without any trouble. It took a little bit of doing, but I definitely got this thing hooked up to the stereo receiver now. So we can go ahead and try playing some music here. I just went ahead and loaded a random burned CD into the top drive. I'll probably go ahead and try the other one here in a moment. Just to make sure that it works, go ahead and play one of the computer upgraders' favorite songs. <laughs> When upgrades don't go so well, do they go down in a blaze of glory? I don't want to play too much of that. Certainly don't want the music mafia coming after us. So let's try a little something else here. Let's see how well it handles playing YouTube, because this was definitely the Achilles heel of the Dimension 2300 with its Intel 845 graphics core and Pentium 4 2.2 gigahertz processor, which was the fastest it could run. And it would do it, but it didn't really care to. Computers are at my window making irritating noise. Computers are in the way when I'm at the ground. And that's the time I sit down and At this particular point in the game, I think it's time to go ahead and close this video up for now. There will certainly be refinements and improvements to this computer, but I doubt that any of them by themselves are going to be particularly video worthy. So it's time to go ahead and shut this one down. Now, while we happen to be on the subject of dusty old computers, I've got a fun little bonus that I thought I'd throw into this video before I go ahead and wrap it up. This little white box computer that I recently collected from another job, again, for recycling. And this one is old and rickety enough that it'll probably end up going that way after I've harvested all the useful parts out of it. This is what's sitting next to an air return for the better part of about oh, 11 or 12 years will do to a computer. <laughs> I pulled this thing out from the wall after I decommissioned it and I was just kind of shocked at how much dust there is all over everything. You know, the fans themselves aren't really dusty, but the air return that this thing was sitting next to, well, it was a big air return, servicing the entire building pretty much, or so it looked. And it had done a good job of sucking up notepads and pencils and dust bunnies and pens and things like that. <laughs> and it did a pretty healthy job of attracting dust bunnies to this computer because, yeah, even these fans aren't that dirty. I have not actually cracked the cover on this machine yet. So I haven't seen what's inside it. Boy, somebody really cranked those on there, didn't they? Probably should have gotten a better screwdriver for this job. But hopefully there won't be an undue amount of swearing involved here. Especially since, as I make this video, it's about 4.30 in the morning. And i got to keep it down a little bit, you know. Because there are people sleeping, but I'm just dying to see if there's anything like bloated capacitors in here. You want to place your bets before I go ahead and crack the cover here? Alright. Wow. This thing's actually nowhere near as dirty inside as it was on the outside. I don't have the world's best lighting here. But 
all of the capacitors on this motherboard are good. I really was not expecting that. <laughs> and a Mac store hard drive, look at that. A Mac store hard drive that lasted for a long time. Well, that's definitely something that doesn't happen every day. <laughs> Alrighty, well, I'd better wrap this up. So, thank you for watching, and by all means, feel free to leave a comment if you have one. <laughs>